Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And as we say in Judeo-Spanish, Shabbat bueno <laughs> uh, to everyone. Uh, today's Shabbat is the Sabbath, so uh, it's okay to use the greetings. And um, I'm really, really very, very pleased and thankful to be here, thankful to Christina that brought us and to John and Jess, they, who made everything to... And you, immediately feel at home in a space like that. That's so wonderful. So my name is Ofer Benamotz. I, am, I teach uh, up the road here, Colorado College. Uh, been there for 23 years. I chair the music department. I teach music composition and music theory and also Jewish music. Uh, today with me, of course, would be Christina, a vocalist, soprano, wonderful soprano. You have a treasure in town that you should know of. A wonderful uh, singer. Um, so, and the pianist is Deborah Ayers, who comes from Santa Fe, and they are going to uh, to give the musical part uh, of today, this afternoon. So, if you get bored with what I have to tell, and you kind of fall asleep, and so you will wake up when they start playing because it's very dramatic. Um, so I wear two hats today. One of a researcher of Jewish music. I did a lot of research on the Judeo-Spanish uh, repertoire in music. And I also grew up in Israel a little bit in this environment because I come from this Latino-speaking family. And I am also a composer, which is part of the revival movement to revive this Judeo-Spanish, Ladino, or Sephardic uh, music. So let me give you some background. The last time I spoke about it, it was the very last lecture in a conference that for three days dealt nothing except for inquisition and, and uh, persecution and all these nice things. And, uh, and uh, I came, I was like the savior that brings the beautiful music in. Everybody was just uh, talk, talking about these horrific things. Uh, but they already knew the historical background, and I'm sure that many of you know, but I would like to just summarize it a little bit in terms of history. So the focus of this event is the history and culture of an ethnic group known as the Judeo-Hispanic, the Sephardim, uh, or in general, Jews of Spanish and Portuguese heritage. When we say Sephardim, people who came from Sephardim, Sephardim mentioned in the Bible, just like as, uh, as Spain. There's also Tzarfat, which is France. Both these places are mentioned in the Bible. People don't really know if this is the actual Iberian Peninsula or France, what we call Paris today, but they are mentioned and these names are taken to those uh, places. Jewish communities existed in the Iberian Peninsula since the early Middle Ages, following the destruction of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem by the Romans in the year 70 to Common Era. Jews moved west and settled along the commerce road of northern Africa, which means Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and uh, also settled along the Mediterranean coast, which is Sicily, southern France, and all the way to Spain. Uh, between the 8th and the 13th century, Jewish communities in Spain flourished culturally, socially, economically, and especially in terms of religious freedom. It's a new concept, religious freedom. Uh, the most significant characteristic of rabbinic thought during this era was the ability to combine a deep Jewish faith based on Torah and Talmud and Halacha with the logic and reasoning of the Socratic and Aristotelian philosophy. So um, I'll tell you in a second what it means. Uh, thus, we can mention several important names of rabbis from this period. In the 11th century, the poet and philosopher Yehuda Halevi, a native of Toledo. The 12th century great Maimonides, or Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, also called the Rambam. We call it the Rambam. When we say Rambam, Today in Israel, everybody thinks you're talking about the hospital. But the hospital is named after Moshe ben Maimon because he was a doctor. And he was a doctor of the Egyptian king of the time. 
So he was a court uh, physician. Um, he was from the 12th century. In the 13th century, followed him was the Ramban, also called Nachmanides, and he was from uh, Girona, which is uh, near Barcelona. The long period between the 8th and the 13th century, well over 600 years, is considered one of the highlights in Jewish history and is termed the Golden Age. Indeed, it was justly labeled as a Golden Age due to a certain harmony and tolerance between the three main religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Termed in Spanish, la convivencia, the coexistence, this would become a perfect example of an unusual peaceful coexistence which started with the Muslim Umayyad conquest of Hispania until the end of the 1300s. The following 100 years, however, or to be exact, the years between 19, uh, 1391 and 1492 are marked with exact opposite. Frequent pogroms, persecution, forced conversions, and the rule of the Spanish Inquisition, ultimately leading to the Edict of Expulsion signed by Queen Isabel and King Ferdinand on the 31st of March of 1492. By this proclamation, all Jews were ordered to leave Spain within three months, otherwise either convert to Catholicism or face the death penalty by the infamous Act of Faith, which also called Auto de Fe, an act of baptizing or purifying one's soul through fire. In other words, burning them at the stake. By 1492, no Jews were left in Spain. About 200,000 of them converted. That's why today there is a big question in Spain about who is whom. There's a lot of genetic exchange there with Judaism, and many people really, they cannot even be anti-Semitic anymore because they don't know what's in their own blood, <laughs> so, which is a kind of a good thing. Some 100,000 left for Turkey, Greece, and the Balkan region. That marks actually the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. About 30 to 40,000 of them crossed the border to Portugal, but were expelled six years later as part of the marriage agreement between the two kingdoms. About 5,000 were killed. That's a relatively, if we think about it, relatively to what we hear about the Inquisition, relatively modest number, but it's still a number. Yes, so no, they did not. There were, some were killed by fire at the stake, other through lynching. There was a lot of lynching going on too. It's also important to mention that many of the Jews who converted to Catholicism started leading a double life. Outside the home, there were pious Christians going to church, uh, doing the rosary, doing everything that uh, confessions. Um, they liked to confess to each other so they could say things that otherwise they cannot say. But knowing that the Inquisition is everywhere, they were very careful. Inside the walls of the home, they secretly kept some Jewish customs and traditions, uh, celebrated Jewish holidays, made sure to marry only among themselves. That's very important. How do we know about this group of Jews? The, the grandmother would say to the grandchildren, you know, I'm not going to live so long anymore. So remember, when you get married, only this and this and these families, but not this and the other families. So th that was a way to create a community an identity within the new identity. These are called crypto-Jews because of the cryptic and the secretive life, and they success successfully led this double life and kept their Jewish identity uh, in regions dominated by Christian majority. Thus, the era of the Golden Age ended up as a century of horror and terror, Interestingly, when I discussed this chapter of history with a dear friend of mine, who is a Spanish Catholic professor in Colorado College, 
He reminds me that the expulsion of Jews and Muslims from Spain in 1492 marks the beginning of the Spanish Golden Age. <laughs> so you see, everything is relative. I know we have some physicians here, so they know what I mean. Everything is relative. Um, uh, physicist, I meant physicist. Uh, now, one would think that after such a brutal and harsh treatment in the old country, Jews would do all they can to forget and even erase the gruesome chapter from the memory. But no, the longing for the lost golden age and its rich cultural heritage, the wonderful old Spanish life, the language and landscape, the music and food were all nested deep in their hearts. Outside of Spain started developing the Judeo-Spanish or Sephardic culture. It started actually in Greece and Turkey and the Balkan. And in Jerusalem, wherever Jews arrived from Spain, they wanted, they started this Sephardic culture with a flourishing Judeo-Spanish or Ladino language. What is the Ladino? So that we know already, Ladino is a medieval dialect of Middle High Spanish which means the higher Spanish of medieval time, which was from the region of Castilla. We know that the queen, Isabel and King Ferdinand, were the kings and queens of Castilla before they took uh, Leon and Aragon and all the other regions. So they spoke Castilian Spanish. Ladino comes from Castilian Spanish, and you will soon will be able to see the, the, the pronunciation that's quite different from the regular Spanish that we know today. Um, so, they, uh, the Jews remember these long old ballads and the matching tunes, the food recipes, and more. Uh, they prudently preserve them. And this, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the actual subject of our concert lecture today, the musical heritage of the Judeo-Spanish or Ladino culture. Yes. I want, before I invite, I'm going to invite our singers in a, in a second, uh, but before I do that, I want to say that Spain, for many, many years, did not recognize the state of Israel. And they, um, in 1992, 500 years to the expulsion, they started the relationship. Uh, it started, we know that it has, it has strengthened over time, but it was very interesting because they had their history of songs and ballads from the Middle Ages, and they were missing a big chunk of it. But they found it after creating the ties with Israel. The research for Israel said, what, don't you know this and this and these ballads? We have them because we kept them. They didn't keep them. So that's a very interesting part of this Ladino uh, repertoire. So there are two things one can say about Ladino music with great certainty. First, the musical and poetic repertoire of the body of works collected and performed is among the most beautiful of any musical genres known to us. Second, it is one of the most contentious and controversial subject of research among musicologists and ethnologists. For example, it is quite common that the same tune would be referred to as a pre-expulsion 15th century or a post-expulsion 16th century romancero by some. But other scholars would argue that it's a 17th century, maybe 18th century, maybe 19th, so there's no end to, to how much discussion they have. Of course, this discussion is uh, totally futile, futile because we can just enjoy the music but the problem is this, the, uh, all this great conviction about where it came from, people want to know more about the identity. It's all a question of, uh, ultimately, of identity. We would love to imagine that these magnificent Ladino songs originated way back in, the, in medieval Spain. And this might help us validate the accuracy of our Jewish-Spanish identity and cultural roots. 
At the same time, we should be aware of the fact that over the last 500 and some years, Ladino has mainly been an oral tradition, so hardly anything written down, spoken but not written. And for an orally transmitted culture, the amount of documentation we have is meager at best. Um, so I, I'll mention just several uh, scholars dealt with the collection, but the most important of them was Yitzhak Levy, um, born in Jerusalem from, to a Ladino-speaking family, and he collected Ladino songs from throughout the world and came up with a record of publication, four books full of Ladino songs. But the most interesting about them is that there is a song a tune the way it was sung in Morocco and next to it the way it was sung in Bulgaria and next to it in Greece or Turkey and in Jerusalem. So you get five versions that might be, they're all similar, but they're not exactly the same. So it's called comparative ethnomusicology. This collection is very important because you can noti notice what was different in certain communities. It could be that the melody is the same, but the text is totally different. It could be that the text is exactly the same, but the melody has a var variant that is unknown. So I'm mentioning him because he was very influential on my work, and when I first started researching, the first thing I came to was his books. Um, so I would like to invite <clears throat> Christina and Debbie uh, to help me invite them here to stage. They are hiding. But yeah, please let me welcome them. <clears throat> and we'll give you some uh, fascinating musical examples here. <clears throat> the first one is called Kadosh Kadosh. Also, it says Kados, but um, we pronounce it Kadosh, and Kadosh means holy. And anybody who knows uh, either the, the Jewish prayer or the Christian prayer, this is uh, the sentence that's called by the prophet Isaiah, Kadosh 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 Adonai Lo Itzevaot, or holy, 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 uh, the Lord of hosts. Um, and in Latin they call it Sanctus. This is a sentence that was taken as it is. Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deus, Sabaot. They couldn't even translate in Latin Sabaot. So they, Sabaot means uh, armies or hosts of angels, actually. That's armies of angels. Um, it's a very enigmatic thing. So um, why do I bring it? It usually appears if you... Uh, buy a CD of Sephardi music, chances are that you will find it on this CD. It's a three-part motet, <clears throat> and um, most scholars agree that it goes back to 15th century, so the 1400s, because of the style, musical style we can definitely identify. Uh, it's written in very enigmatic, even cryptic language, <clears throat> and only three words here uh, are... Hebrew, Kadosh, which is holy, Adonai, which is the name, the, the mystical name of, uh, of the divine, and Cherubim, which is angels. There is also similarity to, to Hebrew when you say Arum Brael, El is also another uh, name of God, El, and then Mao, which is similar to Maim, Maim, Mao etidrorum, idrorum is also sort of a liquid ma water. So water, and it, and that's it, kadosh, kadosh. So the rest of it, nonsense, lumbi, lumbi, I mean, I have no, no context for this, amal, bul, lumbi, lumbi, but it could be an influence from Berber or kind of North African influence. Um, at any rate, uh, this, is a beautiful motet, and uh, I made an arrangement for piano and for Christina with one voice. So let's listen. Oh, 
Okay. I'll move now to talk about the romanceros, which are basically love songs and how they change by, when they're adopted by the Jewish community. So I'm talking about the romancero as an allegory. Another important and interesting fact about the Ladino tradition is that its cultural treasures were carried mainly by women of the community. Indeed, women were the keepers and carriers of all secular music repertoire, including love songs, ballads, lullaby, legends, and anecdotes. While men were busy focusing on the sacred service, the liturgy, the prayer, and the piyutim. What is piyutim? Liturgical poetry. Notice the similarity between the word poet and piyut. It has the same kind of uh, root. It is thus women that we have to thank for the wealth of material, both in poetry and music, that has been orally transmitted throughout the many generations. Thus, legends and ballads, telling of kings and queens, princes and princesses, wars and travel, bears, deaths, wedding, and neighborly gossip found their way into Judeo-Spanish song culture. Secular as these adopted love songs were, they were often embraced with a new meaning, a different interpretation that fits the spiritual needs and subtle psyche of a nation in distress. Thus, the imprisoned princess is not really a princess, but rather Knesset Israel, the assembly of the people Israel, and the lover who comes to save the princess is God, who delivers the people from Galut to Geulah, from exile to redemption. The songs are now treasured and preserved with greater purpose. This is, by the way, a rather typical and known Jewish phenomenon. If we take, for example, Shira Shirim, the Song of Songs, you know, the Song of Songs that attributed to King Solomon, the Hebrew text is a poetic tale of two lovers who search for one another in the alleyways of Jerusalem and throughout the hills of Judea until they find each other and are able to consummate their love. Reading through the scroll of Shira Shirim, the Song of Songs, one is often stunned by the graphic description of physical love and pure eroticism expressed in the text. Some have even called it the Jewish Kama Sutra. <laughs> yeah, try to read it. It reads like that. Yet, the Song of Songs is a mandatory and regular Shabbat reading in every Orthodox household and considered one of the most spiritual and pure parts of the Hebrew Bible. This is only possible due to the belief and Talmudic interpretation considering Shira Shirim to be a metaphor, which is represented, represents the love between God and the people. The physical act of love becomes an allegory to a spiritual and holy bond between the community and the divine. A similar occurrence can be seen in the ballad called La Sirena, the mermaid. 
also known as, also known as La Torre. It will be performed by Christina in the most common and traditional way of Sephardi singing, solo voice. Um, you, you try to imagine the women are there taking care of the household, the, the, the husband either working or mainly studying Torah, and the woman is either cooking or going down to the river to do the, the laundry, to wash the, the laundry, and they sing to themselves, to entertain themselves, to let the time pass. So solo voice was the most common. Uh, so we'll hear now uh, Christina singing this absolutely beautiful La Sirena. And you can see the translation on the side. Thank you, Christina. That's just so beautiful. And I, uh, I want to just briefly make for you the connection between this cryptic double life and singing those songs. Because I may sing this song and think about, there's a love story here, okay? There's a princess in the tower in the middle of the sea. But I can think that this is something between God and the people, and nobody would know. If they blame me to do something religious, Jewish, I say, what do you want? I'm singing just, a, that's a love song. So there is something cryptic about the way that you interpret something and you can keep because thoughts are free. Nobody can go into your brain. You're not a front to anybody. So that's part of why they develop this thing and could live this double life and have these two heads always. I'm Christian but inside I'm Jewish, and so on and so forth. That's, that's because before multitasking of our time. So they were, they were the first to do the multitasking, and they walk on a very thin ice doing that. Um, so I view my scholarly work in researching and teaching Sephardi repertoire in the US. I do it in Spain, in Israel, often in Germany I lecture. Uh, as a, that's an important one, because I talk about a very important chapter of history. But my main interest is in contributing to the preservation and continuation of the genre in my work as an active composer. Uh, why, why am I doing that? We all know Jewish history is pretty long, and there are a few, a few instances that I was almost out with the Jews. We have to think about the Inquisition. We have to think about the Holocaust. They were before, and they could have been even after. But somehow, <laughs> Jews come always back. 
And, and the reason for that is they always, most Jews try to make the best out of this. Like you get the lemon, make a lim lemonade out of it. So if you get this kind of history, try to continue it, try to turn it into something culturally uh, viable so that you can keep. And I feel that uh, as part of, of this group, uh, and as a composer, I have to contribute. And that's what I'm doing. And I, I was thinking about what am I really doing when I deal with this material that I'm taking and creating new arrangement or new musical form. Of. So there are four Asians, what does it mean Asians? Investigation, conservation, interpretation, and revitalization. These are the four steps in preserving this uh, culture and this music. Um, for music creativity, they're so important because investigation means the search for authentic material. Uh, this can be done in a variety of ways, ranging from interviews with the oldest grandma in the village, asking them to sing songs that they had heard in their childhood through hours of listening to field recordings which are available in different archives. <clears throat> uh, for example, the uh, John Donald Robb field recording at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque uh, as an endless resource for Hispanic musical material including some, not many, Jewish songs. So it was very surprising to me when I went and I discovered Jewish songs in this archive. <clears throat> the next step is conservation or preservation, which means documenting those songs. The, instead of having them orally, you write them down, first of all. And you write them down, they are written, they are good for use for other researchers or future generations. Interpretation is the next crucial step. It is the composer's commentary on the traditional material by giving the old music a new personal touch through an original adaptation. This interpretation phase is especially central to the process if we consider that the Jewish ethos and philosophy are largely based on interpretation. We call it, in, in Judaism, we call this Midrash. That's the word for it, Midrash. Um, and I'll give you a picture here of what Midrash means. Um, these are two separate. This is from the Torah. This page is from the Torah. And this is from the Talmud. But what you see, the very... Don't tell me that this is upside down. It's not. <laughs> but it is from the right to the left. The top is the big letters, is the actual words of the Torah. They cannot be changed. Moses got them from God straight. They would stay like this forever. But all the little squares around and all the forms are different rabbis that interpret the text, the big text at the top. So everyone, of course, is a Jewish rabbi. They have a lot to say on about everything. So they have a lot to say about this one, and everybody is kind of arguing with the other rabbi, even though the other rabbi might be from the 12th century as the, as the Rashi, and these guys are from the 16th century, but they decide that they argue with the guy that's already long gone <laughs> on this page. No page like that is ever the same because the length of the verses quoted at the top is different. What they have to say Somebody wants to say more about this verse than other verse. So each page, uh, the, we call this Jewish literature. Why, why is this Jewish literature and how is it different from non-Jewish literature? Call it the Goetia literature. What, when we go to the university, what do we learn? To write footnotes, bibliography and footnotes. And what does the footnote mean? If you go and quote somebody who said that this is true, and he quoted somebody that says that this is true. You go 40 generations back, everybody said that this is true. It must be true, so I can also say that. But not for Judaism. <laughs> you go to the page and you decide what is true for you. It's either this or the other one. It's all about discussion. And that's, 
I like to transfer into the creativity of music. So I'm, I'm calling interpretation as my own touch, and somebody else can take the same melody and create another song in their own style that will be their interpretation. The last one is revitalization, and that's something we don't do. By interpreting, by keeping it alive and giving him a 20th, 20th century or 21st century interpretation, we already keep the things alive, and that's uh, for uh, generations to come, hopefully. So the next we're going to hear is, um, oh, I wanted to, that, that's just a, a, in parentheses. Toledo, 1585 to 1588. This is a, a painting by El Greco. His friend El Medico was a doctor. So this is the height of the Inquisition after the expulsion is already finished. No more Jews in Spain. But this doctor decided, he asked El Greco, please put this little book next to me when you do this painting. What does it look like, this little book? Does it look anything like the pages we, we saw before? <laughs> See? There are no footnotes here, no bibliography. Just So why did he choose that? Why did he do this very risky thing exactly in Toledo? We don't know, but it's, a, it's fascinating. If you ever go to the Prado in Madrid, you will see this glorious, absolutely glorious thing. So Cantes del Vergel de Granadas, uh, that's the name I gave to a, a series of arrangements of very old Ladino tunes. And um, uh, we will hear them now. Uh, we'll hear only three, three of them. One is called My Heart. Yes, Mi Corazon. It's like a, uh, more like a serenade. A love song, again, but love, we know now that love is not just love, it's love. And so my heart under your window filled with pain and engulfed in flames. I'm already tired of playing the guitar. I have not yet seen your beautiful face. So it's a rather short song, but what I did here is interpretation. I put the piano, I gave the piano a big role, like commenting on this text. Um, the next song is another love song, and it's more, it is more like a flamenco style. It's, a, it's fast moving, and that's about a, a young girl in love that she's sorry that she was left alone. She's looking for a lover. And um, this is Entre las Huertas, Between the Orchard. And the last song. Uh, in this cycle, three out of five, as I said, it's called Malato Style Ijo del Rey. The, the prince or the son of the king is sick. And this is a very uh, interesting, it's also the longest. Um, the king's son is ill. It's an old ballad which originally had many strophes, uh, at least 18 strophes. You know, one of the challenges is how to take 18 strophes and not to repeat it 18 times. Um, but there are techniques in composition to do that. And this, the story of it, I'd like you to follow. Can you read well from where you're sitting? Follow the story. It's very much like uh, um, Faustian, Goethe, uh, Goethe's uh, Faust, because the, the angel of death coming, sitting in his bed and say, give me your soul and I will give you everything I have. And, and, uh, but it ends a little bit differently. It ends more Spanish than German. So that you, the difference between Spanish ending and German ending. And so uh, we'll hear now these three in the interpretation where the piano is doing a really great job. And, uh, and Chris, Tina, basically sticking with the, with the original melody, but have some variation with it too. So thank you. Here. Oh, and I would like, if you can, let's not clap between songs, let it all three of them be together and wait with our applause afterwards.
I hope you can distinguish the main melody, which is genuinely Spanish, Hispanic, Latino melody, from the old the dressing that it's put on top of it, which is the arrangement. But this kind of song, that's what we say, in, a dead person in Spain is more dead than anywhere else. <laughs> and uh, uh, I want to say just one more thing about this song, how is this connected to Judaism? Yitzhak Levy, the researcher I mentioned before, writes next to the song, the Jews sang it every year on the, ninth, on the ninth of Av. Ninth of Av is a very special commemorative date on the Jewish calendar because both temples, the one that was destroyed by the Babylonians and the other by the Romans, were destroyed on the ninth of Av. And if you calculate well, the last day of the expulsion from Spain falls around the 9th of Av. So they would sing it, of course, without this piano accompaniment. They sit on, all night on the floor, sing the lamentations of Jeremiah, and also they would sing this song as an allegory for the dead son of the king that um, uh, they were really mourning that. Okay. Now I want to talk about revival, no more death. Um, a Ladino culture really flourished in Israel. Um, I am an Israeli-American composer, and I got interested and involved with it, but I was born in Haifa, and uh, Israel and Ladino-speaking family. So my mother's side, they all spoke Ladino. They came from Bulgaria. Uh, most people from Bulgaria spoke Ladino. And um, when I was born, 1955, the state of Israel was only seven years old. It was really a baby state, newly reestablished. So at this time, um, Hebrew was almost forced upon the young generation. Everybody had to talk Hebrew. If you spoke either Ladino or Yiddish, actually Yiddish got really uh, shunned this was the, the language of the Holocaust, the language of, of the defeatists, the, the losers. They speak Yiddish. The new Israeli, they call us the prickly pears. Prickly pears, sabras. That's like uh, 
has to be prickly at the outside and a little sweet in the inside. So that was the sabra, they call us. And uh, we had to speak Hebrew. So that was a, a little bit of a problem because all these treasures of songs, they, they disappeared slowly. Until the 70s, the culture, people saw that the cultural treasure, both Yiddish and Ladino, has to emerge, re-emerge again. And then Israel really established these authorities for the preservation of Ladino, authorities of preservation of Yiddish, and there were many plays and people started collecting material and putting it in writing in order to save these what we call dying cultures. We know around the 70s, even, I don't know if you're familiar with the name, Isaac Bashevi Zinger, he got, he got the Nobel Prize for writing in Yiddish. And when he spoke, when he got it, he said, I, the rumors about the death of Yiddish were a little bit exaggerated. So, but until today, people do speak Yiddish and people do speak Ladino still in Israel and so on. Um, but nothing would happen unless new material is being created. You cannot just go with nostalgia and say, I'm going to sing it again and again and again. And of course, my, my children will not be interested in this song. They said this song's from old people. And so how do we keep it? We can only keep it if we create new stuff. And new stuff with the rules and, and, and the, the way, the, the style that the old stuff is being built. And that's why I uh, decided to write this uh, Cantigas Ulvidadas, which is the, uh, the next cycle. This is a cycle, again, three songs here, but they are all original songs in the style of Ladino. You let the piano again, it's pretty important. In fact, there's a big introduction of the piano and you may just close your eyes and imagine a guitar, Spanish guitar or oud. If you know what the oud is, that's the Arabic lute uh, that usually accompanies these uh, songs. Uh, this is truly the music. If you think about the music, is is a combination of these Islamic tunes, Arabic, um, Jewish and Christian coming together into one. And only music can do that so beautifully. And so um, the poetry that you will see are living poets from Israel, Ladino speaking, living poet in Israel. Um, I uh, wrote the melodies and the, you can follow the translation on the side. Um, I think we, they are very nostalgic. They are very beautiful. Again, two love songs. And the last one is just a memory song of a woman uh, who goes back to her city and tries to relive and to remember how she grew up as a child in this uh, town. So please, I invite again uh, Christina and Debbie to perform Forgotten Songs, Cantigas Ulvidadas. And let's wait again with applause until the end of all three.
Thank you so much. Mm. We are very close to ending this program. And um, I have just one more example of a song, an old song, Ladino, called La Rosa and Florese. And then we will all collaborate by doing what 
the Sephardic Jewish community in Israel do with the grace after the meal. They use the same very, very old melody with some Hebrew words on the side. So um, I invite everybody to join in the sing-along. First, we will, first, it will be a very quick lesson. So first of all, um, Christina will sing that and Debbie at the piano. And then we will go over the Hebrew just very briefly together and then we'll sing it because it's going to be so much fun <laughs> and a beautiful way to end and to preserve this wonderful culture. Okay, so here is a love song. Uh, La Rosa and Florese, also known as Los Bilbilicos in other recordings. But first of all, we'll hear this beautiful melody with Christina and Debbie. As I mentioned before, this turned in the Hebrew to the grace after the meal, the rock whose food we have eaten, let us bless him. We are satiated and there is still food left over as God has instructed. Therefore, we will thank him and speak his praise. We said and respond, there is no one holy like our God. And so this is in the Hebrew. Let's go once and read it very slowly for the Hebrew. Tzu Michelo. Achalnu, the KH is between K and H. Ha, ha. Americans have a very difficult time. Tzu Michelo Achalnu, Barechu Emunai, Savanu Vehotarnu, Kidvar Adonai. Hazan et Olamo, Roenu Avinu, Achalnu et Lachmo, Veyeno Shatinu. Al ken no de lishmo, unehale lo befinu, amarnu vaninu, en kadosh kadonai. Remember the word kadosh from the very first song? Holy. There's nobody holy as Adonai, as God. So it closed a nice circle here. So let's now try to sing it. As you know, the, the first two are just sung straight, and then the other two lines are repeated. Oh, <laughs> 
Thank you for the wonderful performance. And if you have any question, I'm more than willing to answer. And otherwise, we can go. And that was, there's been a long program. <laughs> there's long Jewish history. You can just squeeze it into like five minutes. <laughs> and so uh, I really thank you. And uh, we can continue there at the fellowship hall. And thank you again for.